Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This is one of our short episodes, and, uh, well, you might be disappointed today. I wonder if you'll be disappointed, because not only is this a short episode, and I can look at the stats of these episodes, and I can see that the short ones don't do as well. But, be that as it may, I rather like doing them. It means I have to sit in this chair for less time. It's a weak excuse. Uh, this is also one that I don't believe it involves any death. What happens here, as always, is... I, I generally come up with a topic, or Callum, our writer, does, and then he gives me this script, which I have in front of me right now. It's light, because it's a short. And I'm not sure that this one has any murder or death or any of that stuff. Just before we get started with today's uh, show, I was wondering what to call this, because it's a YouTube video. It's also a podcast. And I thought, let's just call it a show. It's a show. This is Japan's classic It's the 300 million yen robbery. Uh, it's a classic in Japan, allegedly. Fun fact, Callum, despite being British, lives in Japan. Um, yeah, so there's that. I found him on the internet. Obviously, we did just bump into each other in the pub. I don't know why anyone would think that that's how we would meet. Anyway, this is Japan's classic heist, 3 million yen robbery. Let's just jump into it. People are always asking me, Simon, how can I become as successful in my criminal in my criminal career as you? That is a brilliant question. My criminal career absolutely thriving right now. I mean, the YouTube's just for show. You know, it's uh, underneath basically uh, Heisenberg. I'm the Heisenberg of YouTube. Before leaping into a stolen Ferrari loaded with millions in unmarked bills, I tell them that just like if you want to be a successful musician or painter, you first have to study the classics. Quick question. I mean, a rhetorical question, because obviously there's no one here with me. Are unmarked bills actually a thing? Because don't they all have marks? They all have serial numbers, right? It's got to be mean, like, untraceable. So the serial numbers haven't been written down, or the bills haven't been tagged with GPS trackers or something like that, right? That's exactly what we're going to be doing today. All you criminal aspirants out there, it's a new word to me. I learned something with Callum's script. He's smart, so he uses words like aspirants. I'd just say aspirational people because I'm dumb. Be sure to take notes today. So what makes a classic crime? Well, for the story to really get a hold in the popular imagination, it has to be a few things. Successful, high value, unusual. And if you want people to really review, non-violent too. Today's case, although, you know, <laughs> if you want a podcast in the true crime area to be successful, make them long, make them violent, make sure people get hurt. And today we're doing the opposite of all of those things. So smash that like button leave me a review please listen to this episode to the end <laughs> today's case checks all of those boxes the uh the the crime ones not the podcast ones with bonus points for brazenness it's a vintage heist story which was equal parts ingenious and bizarre and which for many decades remains the most expensive in japanese history the story of the 300 million yen robbery i'm hoping we find out how much 300 million yen is because i have no idea the setup. It's early December 1968, and Tokyo is bustling as usual. We're in the middle of Japan's multi decade heyday when its factories were churning out consumer electronics which won its reputation as a futuristic wonderland for years to follow. Businesses booming, and the country's rapidly expanding middle class more flush with cash than anyone could have predicted a few decades before. Of course, with that much money floating around, there are far more chances for opportunistic thieves to snatch some for themselves. That's why, yeah, I mean, it's always best to be a thief in a rich country. <laughs> Lesson number one for today. Thank you, Callum. That's why on December the 6th, the manager of the Nippon Trust Bank in... Oh, God, my Japanese pronunciation. Koko Bunji? I'm sorry, Japanese speakers who are listening. It's, it's going to be a bad time for you today. <laughs> Received a letter demanding 3 million yen from the bank's deposits that uh, be brought to a nearby location by one of the cashiers before 5 p.m. the next day. If the manager didn't comply, both his home and workplace would be bombed. That's some heavy reading for a Friday morning. Regardless, the manager wasn't so keen to comply. He called the police, who sent around 50 officers to stake out the drop-off point. I'm no expert in police sting operations, but surely four dozen people suspiciously milling around would be enough to deter any decent thief. Unless, of course, they used high-level tactics like cutting eye holes into newspapers, of course. Oh, very good. In the end, nothing came of it, and the weekend passed by without further incidents. I mean, the manager likely had a heart attack every time his kids slammed a cupboard door, but no actual bombing took place. The new work week rolled around, and everything went back to normal. The heist. 
Okay, so far, it's hardly a classic heist tale, but the best is yet to come. It's now Tuesday, the 10th of December. With the New Year holiday season approaching, companies are getting together their end-of-year bonuses with their employees. As I mentioned before, Japan's collective wallet was pretty stuffed back then, so factories were offering more than a Starbucks gift voucher or cinema tickets. Well, I know what to get you for Christmas next year, Callum. You're getting a Starbucks gift voucher for a single coffee. The Toshiba Corporation was having a particularly good run of it, meaning the total cash value of their employees' bonuses was 300 million yen. And if you take a look at the title of today's episode, you'll sense some pretty heavy-handed foreshadowing right now. I sense it, Callum. The bonus pot was roughly equivalent to 3.4 million US dollars in today's money, meaning that four bank staff members accompany were accompanying it on its way to the Toshiba factory, and they were all a little on edge. Okay, it's... I mean... $3.4 million is a lot, but was this really Japan's biggest heist for a long time? I think I mentioned before, maybe it was on another channel I do called Business Blaze, um, there was a Securitas raid in the UK maybe 20 years ago, and they made off with like 60 mil or something insane, and a bunch of them still haven't been got caught and the money hasn't been recovered. There are some heists got hardcore. Things went smoothly enough and they started to close in on their destination. But as they pulled down a road running behind well, it's spelled like f you, but I'm guessing it's not f you prison. It's gonna be like fuhu, fuhu prison, maybe? Anyway, it's the largest in Japan, Something and something strange happened. A police motorbike raced up behind them and pulled in front of the transport car. The officer hopped off and ran over to the car window. He told the driver the worst had happened. The bomb threat, which was made the week prior, had been carried out. The bank had been blown up, as was the house of the manager. Even worse, the police had reason to suspect their car was rigged with dynamite too. The officer crawled underneath to check it out for himself, and sure enough, the car was set to blow. This is pretty clever. I mean, obviously, uh, my guess, as you guys know, I don't read these ahead of time. My guess, there ain't no bomb on that car. That guy ain't a police officer, and he's gonna be like, I'm gonna drive in Japanese. He was <laughs> I'm gonna drive this car to safety, guys. Don't worry about it at all. I'm gonna sacrifice myself. Hand me the keys. Before he could get clear, the bomb began to detonate. Smoke billowed out from the underside of the vehicle. The bank staff ran for their lives, diving behind a wall at the prison, while the officer valiantly leapt behind the wheel to get the ticking time bomb clear of danger. It was even more elaborate. I mean, that's why they're the master criminals and I'm not. I mean, I am. I'm like Heisenberg, not really. The terrified security workers pe peeked over the wall to watch this brave officer risk his life to get the exploding sedan away from them. Very far away from them, in fact. So far away that it was long out of sight. And still, no explosion. Well, not a very loud one, at least. As the blood stopped rushing around their heads, the four men noticed something. Sitting on the road, right where the armored car had stopped, was an extinguished flare. It's unclear exactly how long it took them to put all the pieces together and whether or not you've already done so yourself. I really hope you've done so yourself. <laughs> If you haven't realized that guy ain't a cop and his, you know, that flare was the, the, the smoke, well, uh, you'd make an absolutely terrible detective. Hopefully you're not a detective. If, you've, if, you're, if you're there and you're listening to this and you're a detective and you didn't work that out, I'm sorry for insulting you. <laughs> If you're yet to have your coffee today, I'll spell it out. That was no police officer. It was the thief with an Ocean's Eleven level of preparation, genius, and let's face it, balls. And just like the bomb under the car, and just like the bomb under the car was all smoke and mirrors, so too were the other explosions. None of them actually took place. By the time these thoughts crystallized in the heads of the bank clerks, the money was long gone. Oh, so this is so clever how they're, you know, threatening violence and bombs and all of this stuff and the danger of it but really so far it's just one flare the initial investigation Now, the crime might seem incredibly clever so far, but the thief left behind a plethora of evidence for the cops to go on. As the media frenzy around the story grew and grew, detectives were under pressure to transmute all those A-grade clues into an arrest or two. Transmute is another word, like I know it, I know what it means, but I'd never use it in real life. <laughs> I'm going to try and use transmute from now on. Thanks, Callum. First of all, the motorbike was left at the scene. Anyone giving it more than a cursory glance would instantly recognize it wasn't a proper police vehicle at all. It was just a regular old Yamaha painted white. Checking the license plate proved to be a dead end, as the bike was stolen shortly prior to the theft. Likewise, the megaphone strapped on to complete the disguise was traced back to a construction site where it had gone missing the week before. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be incredibly easy to fake a police car, let alone a police bike. Paint it white, stick some, like... Japanese word for police on the side. 
get some flashy lights off like AliExpress or whatever. Similar dead ends were reached trying to trace the purchase of a hunting cap found inside the bike cover, which the fake policeman was accidentally dragging behind the bike. A can of cookies, which was taped to look like a police document box, the flare, and a pair of off magnets, which were like which were supposed to attach to the car, and a newspaper snippet found stuck to the microphone. Despite a total of 120 juicy pieces of evidence found at the crime scene, the abandoned armored car, and other key locations, no definitive progress was made. It's thought that some of the evidence was deliberately strewn around to waste precious police time on a bunch of red herrings. All they knew for sure was that the robber had type B blood, proven by the traces of saliva on the blackmail letter postage stamp. This was when? The late 1960s? Did we say? Yeah, 68. Did they have DNA and stuff back then? I don't think so, right? But this is the thing. Like, You could be committing crimes right now. Like, Imagine you're these guys and they're like, oh yeah, there's saliva. What are they going to do with that? Like, nothing. They found out he had type B blood. But like, you'd just be, uh-oh. When that DNA technology comes around, you'll be like, "Ah, oh, crap, hopefully they don't reopen this case. Uh, all that, despite the efforts of hundreds of detectives and tens of thousands of police employees. It's even said that a few died of exhaustion while working on the case, although that sounds a little bit over the top. As does the fact that the whole probe cost three times as much as the actual value of the cash stolen. But that part is very much true. Oh God. I mean, I know why, it, I know why you have to spend the money, because then it sets the right message and, you know, criminals going to jail or whatever is is good for justice but that's that's pretty rough the fallout Much of the hefty price tag came from the intense campaign of public interviews which the police conducted in the local area. Using a photo fit image sketched up from the sta statements of the bank employees, they went door to door and interviewed all the college age residents of the area to see if they knew the thief. If that sounds like a pretty scatterball, scatterball approach to you, isn't it? Scatterbrain? I don't know, scatterball, scatter, shot, sc shot. I don't know what the saying is, but whatever. I'm assuming, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to assume Callum's right because he uses all these words I don't know. <laughs> then you're pretty much spot on. Consider the fact that the total list of potential suspects topped out at over 100,000 at its peak. Damn! That means even if you just picked one person at random, you'd have a 0.001% chance of getting the right guy. If he was even on the list to begin with. Yeah, he might not be on the list. He might not be a suspect. One suspect, however, stood out to the police. This guy was Boy S, as the media was calling him. He was reported to be the son of a motorbike police officer and leader of the infamous Takegawa Group Youth Gang, notorious teenaged carjackers and joy riders. Carjacking and joy riding, two very different crimes. Carjacking, I feel like you're going to go to prison for a long time. That's where you, like, Grand Theft Auto star someone's car, right? You go up and you grab them and you take them and that's scary for the person. Whereas joyriding is just stealing a car and riding it around, which I mean is bad, but you're not hurting anyone. I mean, the person who owns the car and you're maybe hurting the insurance company, but it's an insurance company, who cares? <laughs> Just joking. Boy S was just 19. My insurance premiums probably just went up. My insurance agent would be like, they'll, they'll get a message to him somehow, and my car insurance would be much more expensive. I'd be like, God damn it. Boy S was just 19, and not only was he a known delinquent, but he also looked like the photo fit. The police took the four bank employees to visit the home of the suspect, and they confirmed that there was a close resemblance. Whether or not Boy S really did commit the crime, we'll never know. He committed suicide using potassium cyanide pills that same night. Wow, that's hardcore. His father insisted on his son's innocence, and Boy S was cleared of any wrongdoing posthumously. The evidence bore out that, that that's got a way on you police officers who accused him. The evidence bore out that conclusion in the end, too, as his handwriting and blood type were not a match for the culprits. In the end, the bank employees admitted that they never actually got a good enough look at the perpetrator to feel confident about the photo fit. You're gonna, that's gonna weigh, guys. Jeez. They likely just felt heavily pressured into coming up with something useful after their bizarrely comical blunder at the prison. And that's where the facts pretty much leave off with this case. But as we know, that's when fiction comes to fill in the gaps. Or speculation, at least. The case had enough public attention to stoke theories for decades to come. Kinda like Japan's D.B. Cooper minus the parachute jump. I would say that maybe we should cover the D.B. Cooper case on this on, on Casual Criminalist in the future. But I want to see how this one does. Because if robberies do terrible, well, I'm not going to make more robberies because... <laughs> I feel like in the you know when you decide what content you're going to make based on reception, it feels a bit creatively bankrupt. But on the other hand, a part of creativity is making things that people want to see. And if it all wants to watch rubber ones, I'm not going to make rubber ones because I like people watching the stuff I make. All right. 
The policeman's sun angle really stuck, partly because it had the most dramatic appeal of all the possibilities. Those who investigate from this angle will point out the timely suicide of the young suspect and the fact that cyanide had actually been purchased by his father. What's more, the only fingerprints found on the newspaper used to wrap the poison belonged to the father. Could he have possibly coerced his teenage son into suicide for bringing his detective colleagues to their doorstep? That is dark. It's maybe a little far-fetched. If you know anything about the Japanese legal system, you'll know that even being suspected of a crime could completely ruin a person's life. I know nothing about the Japanese legal system, Callum, but that's intense. Extreme psychological pressures and lengthy detentions are used to force confessions out of subjects upon which the country's farcical 99% rate conviction rate is based. Damn. If Boyes chose to opt out of all of that, he wouldn't have been the first nor the last. Also, I mean, that is, that is insane. 99% conviction rate, something is wrong? Like, most people should be going free? Even the guilty ones? Because I, I, I actually went to law school. And one of the things I remember from that, at least in the UK system, is this general, like, you know, there's the uh, reasonable, uh, beyond all reasonable doubt, which means you've got to be absolutely sure that someone is guilty. So the idea of like a 99% conviction rate is a little bit concerning because it means more innocent people are going to go to jail where, uh, than guilty people going free. And generally, like I think the legal system look, looks at it, it's better for a guilty person to be free than for an innocent person to be in prison. And I agree with that. And Japan seems rather scary. They also have the death penalty and they hang people, which uh, I covered that in another video, I believe. Uh, let's get back to it. Even if the suicide was legitimate, there remains the fact that another member of Boyes's carjacking gang, who also had the wrong blood type and handwriting, was discovered to be living quite comfortably in the years after the incident. The police never could trace the source of the money he was using to buy fancy clothes and a nice car, so it's still up for debate. Could it have been a joint effort by the gang who went on to split the money? What? Just find out where his money is. If <laughs> he's spending it all in cash, you're gonna get in trouble at some point. I mean, where's the money come from? Could it be a joint effort by the gang who went on to split the money? How hard can it be to, like, trace it? Surely if you rob that much money. Look, I've seen enough Breaking Bad to know you got to launder that money, or you're going to get in trouble. So, just look to see if it comes from, like, some... Uh, but then it comes from a legitimate source. And you're like, yeah. Suspiciously... Le look into his suspiciously legitimate businesses. That's what I would do. That's that, you know... I'm not good at this stuff. That seems like the most likely scenario so far, although I still get the feeling that when faced with utter confusion, mounting costs, and immense public pressure, pinging, pinning the whole thing on a gang of teenage delinquents might just have been the most convenient conclusion for the police. So there's just one more theory worth mentioning. In 1998, a magazine named Shuhan Hoseki, again, apologize, I apologize, Japanese speakers, <laughs> reported that they had finally cracked the case after 30 long years. They had tracked down a 55-year-old man named Yuji Ogata, who told them how he and his accomplices had smuggled the stolen cash past police roadblocks before splitting up and spreading out across Japan. A convincing narrative, but... And Callum uses a but with three U's there. So, but... Just as Japan seemed to believe one of their oldest and boldest cases would be closed, Agata's ex-wife went on record saying that he was a habitual liar. <laughs> What's more, his family and friends recounted that the perpetually broke Agata son had asked them for money in the weeks and months after that fateful day in 1968. Hardly the actions of a newly minted millionaire. The story was obviously just the work of total, a total nonsense merchant looking to make a quick buck off the crime. But I already knew that, of course. See, in truth, it was me! Oh, Callum, no! I committed the Great Bank Japanese Bomb Hoax. Good lord, it's got a long name. Great Japanese Bomb Hoax Robbery of 1968. And you can find all of the details in my new mem memoir on the lamb in Japan, just $9.99 plus postage and packaging. Gallum, are you plugging your merch that doesn't exist? Someone suggested a great merch item. We have no merch for Casual Criminalist yet. It's way too new. Not nearly enough people watch this channel for it to have merch. But someone was like, oh, there was such a brilliant idea. I can't even remember what it was though, so it wasn't that brilliant. If you've got ideas for Casual Criminalist merch, comment below. Or if you're watching this as a podcast, well, podcasts don't have comments, so I, I guess too bad. And that's pretty much it for today, folks. In reality, we'll probably never know who the man behind Japan's most audacious heist really was. There is still some hope of seeing a tidy conclusion, but not through an arrest. The statute of limitations expired in 1975, and even all civil liability for the crime ended in 1988. The culprit could go on TV tomorrow and confess with zero legal consequences. That's quite a short statute of limitations for, like, robbery. Six years? All right, but when you're sitting flush on a pile of cash on a tropical island somewhere, why bother? 
Now, there's one last thing to clear up. I know what I said in the intro, but if you're really just looking to get your own pile of cash, please don't just replicate every anything you've heard here. Just buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> don't buy a lottery ticket, please. I rant about this on one of my other channels so much. Don't buy lottery tickets. It's a waste of money. And even if you win, it's probably not going to make you happy. And remember that if you do get arrested for making bomb threats, a YouTube personality told me to do it is not a valid defense in court. And just, I'm going to throw in, we're not telling you to do this, Callum. You're going to get me in trouble. And not just with my insurance agent. This has been a Casual Criminalist Short. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're listening to the show as a podcast, you know what to do. Leave us a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time, probably, almost certainly, for a long version. With more violence and blood and gore and all of those horrible things that you people love.